Welcome to the first lecture for regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning for 2020. So this course has 13 lectures. This is the first, our introductory lecture. And in this lecture, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to start with the story of environmental regulation in action and then talk about who I am, who you are, and run through the course profile. I want to begin, though, by recognising and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, elders past, present and emerging, and future generations on which we hold this land in trust. I also want to acknowledge the human lives lost, the billions of animals killed, and the billions of dollars of damage in the past few months by bushfires substantially driven by human-caused climate change. So the pictures of New Year's Eve uh, I think are burnt in the Australian memory now. The pictures of Australians uh, huddled on beaches under towels with red skies uh, in desperate situations. And it's hard to capture the horror of those fires sitting here in an air-conditioned lecture room. But there was a fantastic story recently on uh, ABC Four Corners uh, and I just want to play you a little bit of it. It's a, it's a great presentation you can look at on the, um, on the internet because you can just, it's one of those that you can scroll down and you get the footage. Uh, the, this footage that I'm going to play you was taken by this girl, Indian McDonald. She's 19 and she was defending her farm in East Gippsland in Victoria with her father. And the pictures, the, the noise is um, muted in it. She's wearing a, uh, a mask. But basically the sound in the background as, as she's filming this is of her breathing into her mask. And this is her dad. She goes up, Dad, Dad, what can I do? And you can see the fire coming towards them. She runs over and he says, he says, go and get a hose and hose down the house. She runs over, she finds that the hose is uh, in pieces uh, because a fire has caught it and it's, it's basically come apart. And yeah, that's, uh, uh, and then she's, the, the pictures show her running around basically trying to put out fires while these, this ember attack is occurring. And it's a really desperate, uh, yeah, extremely scary uh, footage of, of her. They, both of them survived. Uh, they saved their house, but you can see the, just how close it came for them. And unfortunately, a lot of people died and a lot of properties weren't saved. And as we know, billions of animals were lost as well. So that's some context for our course. We're in the middle of a climate emergency, so last year was the second hottest year on record, uh, and the last decade was the hottest decade ever recorded in, obviously, in instrumental uh, history. So 2019 was the second hottest year on record, and there wasn't even an El Nino. So these fires have made climate change a reality of the present tense for many Australians, not something that we can put off to the future. That's, I think, a very apt statement by Laura Tingle, who's the ABC chief, uh, chief political correspondent. She said that in early January. So it's now a present reality, not something that we're putting off to the future. And if you're following it in the news, the Great Barrier Reef uh, looks like it's on the brink of another major coral bleaching event. So we've already got bleaching in the northern sections of the GBR, and it looks like there's going to be mass bleaching in the next few weeks. So you'll see it in the news seems that the only thing we'll, that will avoid it is if we get a major cyclone come in and basically stir up the ocean enough to cool it down. So this is like a bushfire in the ocean. It's a marine heat wave that's essentially killing um, massive uh, ecosystems. So and a Great Barrier Reef is um, facing that right now. So the tragic reality is that based on current global, national and state government policies and practices, we're on track to lose the Great Barrier Reef within our lifetimes. So we can see the reef being severely damaged right now when we've got a mean global temperature rise of about one degree. So the global plan and the Australian plan and the state plan is to allow global temperature rises to go to 1.5 or two degrees mean global temperature change. So just think about that. We're already seeing severe bleaching at 
one degree mean global temperature change. And our plan is to allow it to go to t basically 1.5 or 2. On current policies though, we're actually going to go shoot past 2 and we're on track more likely for 3. So we've got a massive problem. So our government talks of adaptation and resilience and technology over taxation, but it never talks about the costs of inaction. And the Australian bushfires and coral bleaching show us these costs. So these impacts are symptoms of global, national and state government and legal failure to protect us in our environment. And I say failure, does anyone think this looks like success? So would anyone agree that you know, losing the Great Barrier Reef would be a successful policy outcome for Australia? What if it's going to cost us $100 billion to protect it? Do you think that that might be money worth, worth spent? So I actually don't actually care what the price is. We should be trying to protect it no matter what. The fact that we are agreeing to policies that we know are going to destroy it is uh, tragic and criminal. So this course isn't about failure though, and we'll, but we'll talk about a lot of problems uh, and failures to learn from them. So my aim in this course is to give you practical knowledge and skills to make a positive difference to the world in your careers. And I really want you to succeed in changing the world where others have failed. So my core message to you in this course is use the tools you've got to save what you can. So whether you're a town planner, an environmental manager, an engineer, uh, an environmental scientist, whatever degree you're studying, you are learning a lot of things and you have a lot of skills that you can make a difference with in your career. So we, we all can't be you know, Barack Obama or some you know, Greta Thunberg, some amazing world leader but we can use the skills we've got to do what we can. I just relate that to, there's a US philosopher, Joanna Macy, and she talks about practicing active hope. And that's very much what I believe and very much what this course is about. So giving you practical skills and knowledge to make a difference. So in the context of maintaining active hope, we can learn from failure the failure to protect people in the world we live in comes from billions of small cuts, many large stab wounds and several shotgun blasts to the chest of our planet. So a shotgun blast to the chest of our planet that's currently occurring in Australia uh, and in Queensland and what I want to use as a story of environmental regulation and in action is the approval of the Adani coal mine uh, in Queensland approved by the national and state governments in the main approvals occurred through 2015 to 2019. So recent uh, approvals. I'm going to dive, I really want to dive into some of the technical details of the facts of this mine because uh, I really want to just use this as an introductory example of the complexity of environmental regulation in action. So this course will challenge you. It'll challenge you in terms of the, the technical aspects of the law. So for most people coming into this course, you don't come with any background in law or regulation or policy. So you're going to find it challenging to get across that and I'm here to help you with that and I hope that you'll leave the course with much better skill set in that area. But it, the reality of environmental regulation is it's hard in practice, not so much for the laws, the laws are complicated, but the problem that we, problems that we deal with are incredibly complicated. They're incredibly complicated factually and also in the disputes that they cause within society. So the many stakeholders, say, in the climate change debate, the people that, you know, say, the state government and federal governments that are approving these mines, the proponent, the Adani um, uh, company, uh, the coal sector, uh, the community generally, some that support um, the mine, many that are opposed to it. So there's many stakeholders in any dispute, and this is a really good example of that. So let's dive in and swim around in this, but don't worry about the technical details. So I'm going to talk about groundwater, I'm going to talk about um, a bird species called black-throated finch, and I'm going to talk about climate change. 
but you don't have to remember the technical stuff. What I really want you to see and get from this is, hey, this is really complicated factually, and that's the context within which the law operates. It's not easy. So this mine is proposed in central Queensland. Uh, this is some of the players in it. So our Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, uh, the chairman of the Adani Group, which is an Indian energy company. It's a multinational energy company based in India. Um, Gautam Adani is the chair of it. Uh, and the family, sorry, the company group is named after his family name. Uh, this is uh, shaking hands in December 2016 uh, in relation to some uh, associated development in Port of Townsville and uh, related things. So here's another player in this uh, story, our Prime Minister. Uh, it was then the Treasurer holding up a lump of coal in Parliament. So the state and federal governments have lockstep support for the coal sector. So this is our Prime Minister holding up a lump of coal and saying uh, to the opposition across the table, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. You've seen, no doubt, maybe you've participated in some of the protests against the mines. So this Stop, Ad Stop Adani campaign has been massive in the last few years, huge protests. So the mine is located about uh, 300 kilometres inland from Mackay and the mine, okay, so it's 300 kilometres from the coast. The, the project involves the mine and then a rail line to Abbott Point, which is north of Bowen. It's a big coal terminal. So there's aspects of this project are the mine, the coal, sorry, the uh, rail line, and then the uh, terminal. So if we zoom in to the project, so it's a massive um, coal mining lease that's proposed. It's, uh, it's in pastoral company, it's pastoral country, so it's on the pastoral lease Moray Downs, but uh, there's a number of other big pastoral leases around it, Dungmabulla, Lingnam, Melaleuca. And if we focus in on the actual mine layout, this mine is enormous. It consists of, in the eastern side, so on the right of that image, a series of open cut coal mines, so open cut pits, so that's where we dig down into the ground from the top you end up with a big hole in the ground. And these pits run from the north here. All those green stippled boxes are big mining cut pits about four kilometres across. And then what look like louvers just to the right of that, that's where the mine goes underground because the coal dips from east to west, it gets deeper. So in the east, they start at the top and just dig down and extract the coal. And then when it gets too deep to be economically attractive to take off all of that dirt over, over the top of it, they go underground. So here's an example of an open cut pit. So in this pit, you can see the overburden up here. The brown is just earth. And then we get down to the coal seams where uh, this drag line is still taking off some of the overburden. They're getting down to the good coal, which is then extracted. So the coal is taken by rail to the coast and goes out through the port of Abbott Point, which is this long, looks like a long, skinny um, jetty going out. So the coal is deposited on land and then it goes out on a conveyor belt to be loaded into ships in deeper water. So that's Abbott Point. Now, back in 2012, there was a massive boom in the coal sector and there was a proposal to massively expand Abbott Point. So there's a range of different proposals. The existing uh, terminal is T1 and it's just a single pier going out and there was different proposals, a multi-cargo facility or a series of piers going out. So all of that was part of the sort of assessment process. There was a lot of uh, objections and, and litigation about the expansion of Abbott Point but that was to take coal from a range of coal mines that were proposing to expand. That really died through 2013, 2014, 2015 when the, basically the price of coal really dipped and a lot of these projects fell away. Adani has sort of continued on, sort of like a zombie. Uh, it, it's sort of been st stabbed through the heart or you know, through the chest several times with a wooden stake or I'm mixing up vampires and zombies anyway. It's a zombie and it's, it's dead, 
but it keeps on going on. So it's gotten all its approvals, but the financial case for it just doesn't make sense. It hasn't made sense since 2015. Uh, and at least my view is what's happened is the company bought into it in 2010 when the policies in India were very different and the outlook for coal was very different to what it is now. They invested over a billion dollars in buying the leases and all of the, the work. Now they're so far basically into debt for it that they don't want to walk away and write off that debt. So they keep it going basically probably to be able to sell it on to someone else, but they just don't want to realise the debt. That's my view, anyway, because it doesn't, doesn't make any sense financially now to build this big mine. The thing I really want to emphasise, though, is how enormous these are. Has anyone been to a big mine? So a few of you? Okay, so I must admit, until I drove around a few, like on court visits, I did not realise how massive these things are. Like, you get in a car, and you drive for the whole day and you're just driving around the outer perimeter, like with the Adani mine, we'd get in the car and drive for like four hours south and you're just basically running along where all the pits are going to be. So this mine is 25 kilometres across by 32 kilometres north to south. To give you some idea of the scale of that, so UQ where we are now in Brisbane, so the campus is about one kilometre across. So if you basically, who came from the the lake's bus stop. Okay, so you walked maybe about 900 metres to get here, maybe 800 metres. So, probably felt like a fair way. Um, was to me carrying a big bag with a whole heap of stuff in it. Anyway, that's a kilometre. Four by four would basically, from with St Lucia, would basically take out West End all the way into the city. So who lives within that square? Okay, so maybe 30% of us. So that's a four by four, imagine that as a four by four pit, 80 metres deep. Okay, that would be a massive, massive area affecting tens of thousands of people, plus a river going through it. So if you took this at the area of the mining pits and just put it as a box, it would stretch from UQ all the way north to Petrie, pretty well to Redcliffe. So, and it'd be eight kilometres across. And what I'm gonna do is just stretch the layout across Brisbane. So here's the layout. It would stretch from Logan Home all the way through to Chermside. So it is incredible how big this is. Like if you were to drive from Logan Home to Chermside, uh, even if you got in one of the tunnels and were going like at 80 kilometres an hour, it's going to take you a fair while. So who lives in that footprint? That's going to be pretty well everyone here. So that's the context some of the context and background for this mine, but the broader context is that it's also about opening up a new coal basin. So in Queensland, we've got uh, a number of massive coal basins. So the Bowen Basin is the famous one where there's about 50 operating coal mines now. So that's close into the coast near Mackay and stretching south, and there's a whole heap of big coal mines there, mostly coking coal used for steel production. So west of that is the Galilee Basin which has got billions and billions of tonnes of thermal coal, so lower grade coal used for electricity production. It hasn't been developed previously. Why do you think it hasn't been developed previously? Any ideas? Yes? Yep. Yep, so it's not as good quality. Up the back. Yep. But also just go back, we've got the Bowen Basin, got a hell of a lot of coal in that place. It's much closer to the coast and much better quality coal. So that's where most of the coal sector has been developed. There's been some south, there's still some out on the Darling Downs. So we're gonna go out to a, uh, for our group assignment and the field trip, we'll go out and look at a coal mine that's operating out there called the New Ackland Coal Mine. So there are some other coal mines, but most Queensland coal mines are in the Bowen Basin quite close to the coast, hell of a lot of rail lines already there. So if you were in the coal sector, why would you go any further and build new infrastructure? Because it's not only the rail, but you've got to get water, you've got to get power. It's really expensive to go further, particularly hundreds of kilometres further inland. So the attractive thing though, and, and the thing that through about 2008, through to now that was attracting companies into that area was there was just an enormous amount of coal there. 
But to make them viable, what the companies did was basically supersize them. So most of the mines in the Bowen Basin are extracting about a million or two million to 12 million ton of um, coal a year. These mines in the Galilee Basin were all proposing to extract like 30 million, 60 million tons of coal a year. So the Carmichael mine was proposing to, to extract about 60 million tons of coal a year. Originally, it applied for a, a lease for 150 years. Like, it's just a phenomenal amount of coal that's there. So the core questions for any development, including a mine, and these are a couple of, this is, the, these first two questions reflect what's going to be the structure for a lot of our lectures through this course is, does the activity require approval, government approval? And if so, during any application process, what must be assessed? And is the approval likely to be granted? So they're the two main questions you have if you've got a new project. Whatever, whether you're a planner or an environmental manager working for a consultancy, you know, working for a mining company, those are your two basic questions. What approvals do we need? Are we likely to get them? And then if you get approval, it's all about complying with the conditions of your approval. So the main approvals for coal mines in Queensland 10 years ago was an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act, a mining lease under the Mineral Resources Act, and an approval under the Commonwealth legislation called the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It's got a really big name. Basically, the name is a, is a bit of a um, PR stunt. They took every word that they could think of that had a good jingle and they put it all together. Most people just call it the EPBC Act for short, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So two main approvals at a state level, one big approval at a federal level. No real local government approvals needed for this. We'll see when we look at the planning scheme that typically it's local government that has the major approval making uh, role. Um, embedded in this, there is an environmental impact statement under the um, State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, but that's not a separate approval. We'll look at that in the mining lecture and, and we'll talk about environmental impact assessment and EIS. So they're the main approvals for a coal mine. And basically you, you look at them and, okay, there's a trigger that you've got to get an approval, but are you likely to be approved at the end? You look at the criteria that it's going to be assessed against. And for mines, the criteria are very broad. Unlike the planning system where there's plans of where you can go, generally for mines it's pretty well anywhere subject to broad tests like the public interest and economic and social matters. So there's no quantitative limits for impacts above which refusal is mandatory. It's very discretionary. There's been a lot of litigation about this mine, more than probably any project in Australia's history. So that's just a list. I've been involved in several of the cases, in the land court, the federal court, whole range of stuff going on for really since 2014. Against the port, the mine, Pretty well, yeah, all aspects of the project have been litigated against. And if you want more information about it in terms of detail, you can go and look at my website. There's a big case study with a whole heap of the expert reports. I just want to pull out some of the ac aspects of the expert reports to deal with those th three factual issues, some of the, the um, yeah, things related to groundwater and the like. Uh, but I just wanted to pause for a moment with a bit of um, humour because this mine, one of the cases um, was successful and the, uh, an approval was set aside by consent by the federal minister and it led to all of these crazy claims about lawfare. And there were some great cartoons uh, at the time. So this was back in 2015. So this is a, a, the mine approval was set aside for failing to consider some threatened species. One was called the yakka skink and another was called the ornamental snake. So here in this picture you've got the then Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, with Adani Cole in his hat and he's got uh, Greg Hunt, who looks, I think he's meant to be a frog, I'm not, he was the Environment Minister, uh, but Greg Hunt and there's the yakka skink saying, ah, oh, I understand there's a risk your environmental protection laws may inadvertently protect the environment. And Tony Abbott saying, believe me, I'm as shocked as you are, Cecil. 
and yeah, the government claimed it was a technical difficulty with the approval process. And then this is um, one of my favourite cartoons of all time uh, as a lawyer, um, a legal nerd. Uh, you don't often get cartoons, um, good, good cartoons for uh, cases you're involved in. So this is one of my absolute favourites. So is your so this is in the context of 2015. So you know lots of terrorism stuff going on, Australia trying to turn back votes and all of that stuff going on. So that that's the context, uh, war in Syria. So in that context, is your local skink self-radicalising? Be alert for these telltale signs regularly visits extremist websites and there's the skink with the little mouse and he's looking at the intergovernmental panel on climate change and the global carbon budget so an extremist website rejects routine customs and eating habits and he's there he's rejecting adani coal and hangs around other isolated vulnerable species and you can see there the skink with the ornamental snake they're both threatened uh, and talks about travel to prescribed conflict zones such as the federal court and he's got a copy i love the glasses being someone who wears glasses, and I'm also bald. So there's the skink uh, looking at the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So that's our national environmental laws. So that's an amazing skink, don't you think? And he's called the National Insecurity Hotline, George, and that's George Brandis was the Attorney General at the time. So now the future of this mine, humor aside, the future of this mine remains highly doubtful despite approvals. Economics is the real killer, so it got, it's had all its approvals for years. It hasn't proceeded yet, uh, and it may never proceed um, because of the economics have really changed since 2010 when it was initially proposed. And the price of coal has fluctuated, uh, say, in the last 15 years. There have been some peaks. Back in 2008, in the global financial crisis, China imposed some, basically, some massive expansion, and, uh, and there was this... Uh, shortage of global coal supply. So the price of coal rocketed up to $193 a tonne, this is thermal coal. It then dropped back down and rose back up in 2011 to $142 a tonne. Now that was the time when the company was initially proposing the mine to go ahead and the outlook for coal looked pretty good. Renewables still look just like a sort of fringe, funny sort of issue that wouldn't ever really displace coal. But since 2011, coal just entered this long-term long decline in terms of its price, and it went down to 2015, where the price had gotten down to $55 a tonne. And there were comments from economists saying, the wave of oversupply of coal is absolutely staggering. So at $55 a tonne, it just basically wouldn't be worth going ahead with this mine. And that was the context for no bank in Australia being willing to back it. So the, the company just couldn't get a financial backer for the project because the money just looked, it looked like you were going to invest, you know, 15, 20 billion dollars uh, and then it would be stranded, that it would, you'd never get your money back. So why invest that in a time when the price of coal is decreasing, renewables are surging and the world is saying, hey, we need to take action on climate change. Maybe it's not a good idea to develop a massive new coal basin. So it looked really grim. And then what happened in 2016 was China restricted its own domestic coal supply to bring the price back up to support its own domestic producers. And it meant the global price of coal came back up to, in July 2018, it was back up to $120 a tonne. But it was China basically that was driving the, China is the, the major consumer of coal in the world and also one of the major producers. It produces a lot of domestic coal, but Australia is the biggest exporter of coal in the world along with Indonesia and we are really important for the seaborne thermal coal market and essentially coal consumption in China can be hedged against the domestic supply and the seaborne thermal coal so Australia's global supply is important because it, it affects the price of coal that essentially people can buy it for in other countries and China though is this big dial on what the price will do. So price of thermal coal is right back down to $66 and it looks like it's going south. Depends really on what China does, but the, the outlook for coal is really poor because of the rise of renewables, but also climate change policy. So even in 2015, the miners' own economist, John Stanford, was saying, this is an extremely risky project. Everyone knows it, I admit it. So this is the own expert for the mining company saying that. 
And at that time, you could have bought a coal mine for one dollar. So there was Isaac Plains, this mine was actually bought for one dollar. You might think, that's just crazy. How can you buy a big mine for one dollar? Well, why they bought it for one dollar was they were also buying the rehabilitation costs. So tens of millions of dollars of liability was what you were taking on. So they, they were taking that off the books of the company that was selling it. So, but in the context where you can buy an existing mine for you know, one dollar plus the liabilities, why would you, why would you invest you know, 15, 20 billion dollars in a new mine? So lots of um, bankruptcies in the coal sector. So this question, the financial question, it's not the legal system that's stopping this mine, it's the finance, finances of it. But I want to look at three aspects of the approvals because we can leave aside the economics and just focus on, well, how did it make it through the approval processes? What were the big issues? Three things I want to focus on, groundwater, biodiversity and climate change. And I just emphasise, don't be worried about the detail, the technical details of these three things. I really just want to use it to dive into the complexity and swim around a bit and give you an idea, hey, this is really hard. So the mine uh, is, the mining lease uh, is, in terms of groundwater, um, the mining lease is shown there in the sort of yellow mustard. To the west of it, uh, there is a springs complex called the Dungmabulla Springs Complex. It's actually to the west and off the mine site, so they're not actually going to clear the Dungmabulla Springs. But remember I said the coal is dipping from the east to the west, the coal is getting deeper. So the critical issue for these springs is where is the water that feeds them coming from? Because the mine is going to dewater this, where the coal seams are because they need to do that to extract the coal. They take water out of those coal seams. So if the groundwater that feeds the Dugmabulla springs is coming from the layers around where the coal seams are, then the springs will stop. So, yeah, the springs, there's a whole heap of them. There's about 60. They're quite amazing. So this is a, a still image. I'm going to play you a little video of this. But before I play you the video, the source of the springs is actually over here. I've been into it a couple of times. Uh, there's big melaleuca trees growing. Water's been flowing out at that site for tens of thousands of years, uninterrupted. The surface water that you see looks really attractive, but it's... Um, fed from that source over there. So this is a bit of drone image rising up and it'll turn around a bit. I just want you to see how dry the country is, dry and flat. So in the context of a dry environment, permanent water is more valuable than gold. So the, you can see the um, source of the springs or one of the springs there. This is called Moses Lagoon. And you can see how green it is and see how dry it is in the distance. So it gives you the context for the significance of groundwater. It's a, they're ca working cattle properties, but they're also very, very rich in biodiversity and endemic biodiversity. So you, you go there and there's lots of kangaroos and birds and the like, but the really exciting things from a biological perspective are actually a lot of the sedges and a lot of the things that only grow around those groundwater springs. So there's really high endem endemism around the springs. So this is some of the attractive looking surface water. That's not really the exciting thing from a biodiversity perspective. Here's another one of the springs, sort of looks like a golf course, but it's not. Water's been just coming out, trickling out at that location. They're called mound springs and water's just coming out and basically it's all sedgy and wet. And you can see how dry it is around it. This is another spring, uh, and one of the springs actually has water just coming out. Years ago, uh, it was modified so that uh, farmers built a turkey nest around, you know, turkey, what do we call them, a turkey nest dam. Basically, it used to just flow out onto the ground, but they build a, built a small earthen wall around it and when you go there, it's sort of like a nice big open pond, uh, and, but water is just basically pouring out. It's not being pumped from the ground. So that's what's called an artesian spring. And what causes an artesian spring, what causes water to just flow out of the ground, is that somewhere else the water is coming into the ground 
and it's confined when it gets into the ground by a confining layer. And then there's a way for the water to get back out. So what it's called, if you look at this diagram, there's a recharge area. And basically confining layers are layers of sediment that water can't really get through. Uh, so underground aquifers essentially more perme permeable rock and then with a confining layer above it and then an artesian well you'll drill through the confining layer and often that will just flow without pumping but a groundwater springs that are flowing um, generally come from faults through the confining layer so that's the context for an artesian spring or well and a critical question for this mine was well where does Dumabula Springs come from? It's really important from a biodiversity perspective. It's not on the mine site. And basically what the miner did, there's a whole heap of work done on groundwater. And there was a, a groundwater model constructed with 12 layers in it, so a complex numerical computer model uh, with each of the layers in the groundwater model having different properties for uh, vertical connectivity and uh, horizontal connectivity, basically the rates that water flows through those layers. And then you model what will happen with the mine if you dewater one of the layers deep down. So there are all these layers, but a really important one was called the Rewind Formation here, so which was layers six and seven in the model. And beneath the Rewind Formation were all of the coal seams so this is the, where the miner wanted to get to and also where it was going to dewater. So the mining company and its consultants um, had a conceptual model that the groundwater from Dungmabula Springs was all coming from above the rewind formation. They said, at a regional level, this is a regional aquitard, no water is coming from beneath the rewind formation, therefore there will be no impact or very, very minor impact on Dungmabula Springs if the mine proceeds. So they were estimating a maximum of about 20 centimetre drawdown. I worked with an amazing expert from Melbourne, a fellow called John Webb. He's a, a, a lecturer in hydro, hydrogeology um, in Melbourne. And I was really struck with him when he worked on it. He tried to get all of the information together and look at, well, what makes sense based on general hydrogeological principles and all of the evidence we've got. And one of the things that really concerned him was on the mine site they had a lot of evidence of faulting. So breaks basically going through the layers. And he looked at the groundwater heads in the different layers and the information that we had said that the deeper layers, if they were connected to the Dungmabula Springs, there was enough uh, head, groundwater head, to drive, be driving the springs. So he said a plausible alternative conceptualization was there's a fault coming through the rewind formation and that the deeper coal seams could be a source of the springs. Now Dani fought that bitterly and one of the ironies was, irony? That's not the right word. The tragedies of the approval process was they were never forced to actually work it out uh, so they maintained that, no, no, our model is right and there's no possibility, no realistic possibility that there's a fault. But their own data from the mine showed a very different story. So on a mine site, you do a lot of seismic uh, testing for faulting because it, it's very important for your planning for your mine. So they had spent a lot of money doing seismic testing. And what the seismic testing showed was that it was faulting all the way through the rewind. This was one of the, this is some of the seismic testing. And this red line is a fault running from about 200 metres to about 300 metres, I think actually about 600 metres through the rewind formation. So there's faulting on the mine site, but Adani didn't do any uh, testing for faulting around Dungmabula Springs. And they said, there's no evidence of faulting around Dungmabula Springs. And we were saying, but you've done no testing there. And on your mine site, there's faulting. Why don't you test for faulting around Dungmabula Springs? And they refused to, and they weren't forced to. Um, a lot of the literature in groundwater also says in the Great Artesian Basin, water can come from really deep down. So faulting 
is a recognised source for springs in the Great Artesian Basin. This is just um, from a paper uh, of a, some springs quite close to the mine showing water um, is likely to be coming from a thousand metres deep to the surface. So it's certainly plausible that the springs are fed from deep down, but we just don't know for sure. And what the approvals did was they said that, well, we'll give you an approval and you can test for where the source is after. Once you start mining, um, and then in the, that was in 2015, then late last year, so there were some conditions attached to the mine saying that they had to have a groundwater management plan and there was a lot of toing and froing about that, but just before the last federal election was announced, the federal environment minister basically announced that she had approved the um, groundwater management plan, again, without knowing where the source of the springs was. So the conditions of the approval, um, I'll just read you a little bit, of a, little bit about it. This is condition 27, Rewind Formation Connectivity Research Plan. At least three months prior to commencing excavation of the first box cut, the approval holder must submit for approval of the minister a Rewind Formation Connectivity Research Plan and basically down in D it says you have to work out the source including by considering faulting. Now the conditions only required them to submit a plan, they didn't require them to actually do it and they didn't require them to actually do, to get any results. And apart from that, the, one of the real features of the conditions of approval was there was no limits for drawdown. So the mine had said, okay, well, we're not going to have an impact on the Dungwabula Springs, but the conditions, and, and they said the maximum impact we think we'll have is about 20 centimetres. The mine conditions actually didn't say whether that was good or bad. They just said monitor it. And if it's worse than you think, we'll make up We'll make it up as, you, as we go along. We'll adaptive manage. So there was no thresholds for when the mine had to stop, for instance. So, you know, you might say, well, in a condition you could say, monitor groundwater, and if drawdown is more than 20 centimetres, then you must cease mining immediately. So you could impose that as a condition. But, of course, the miner would go, oh, my God, that sounds terrible. We've got a $20 billion investment, and you're going to shut us down over fucking groundwater? You've got to be joking. That would be the reaction, expletive included. So that's not in the conditions because that's not acceptable to the miner. And basically, we, you know, from a government perspective, we want this mine to go ahead. Jobs, all that jazz. Um, a lot of the conditions often are just window dressing around approving a project. So adaptive management is what we use to, to approve these things. It's basically um, a lot of criticisms of the sort of opaque post-approval um, assessment that goes on with adaptive management. Basically, adaptive management can be good if things aren't going to get out of control. So you adaptive manage all the time if you've, say, got a garden. You know, you, look, you walk out in the morning and your plants look wilted, you think, oh, I need a bit of, you know, everything's dried out. You go and get your hose and you water the garden. So you're adaptively managing if you're a gardener. Uh, the problem with adaptive management, though, is if you've got something that you can break, like would you, would you if you had a, um, I don't know, a very, very valuable crystal vase, you know, and you were going to throw it in the air and then adaptively manage how you catch it, um, well, if you miss it, the crystal vase is going to be broken. So adaptive management isn't very good if you've got something that can be broken that you can't fix. So without substantive limits to guide and constrain it, adaptive management can become nothing more than a mere process that fails to deliver substantive environmental outcomes. That's just from a great paper in 2014 by a um, lady named Jessica Lee. So it's been a pattern for modern uh, mine approvals is that we use adaptive management to wave them through and say we'll suck it and see, we'll see you know, how it works and fix it as we go along. So that's groundwater. My view, a really fundamental misuse of adaptive management, but adaptive management is really widely used in our environmental regulatory system. The second thing I want to just mention is black-throated finch, because this mine didn't just have one environmental problem, it had a whole host of them. So the big biodiversity problem it had was uh, this bird. I remember being with our 
this silk, this great uh, silk named Saul Holt, and there were actually two threatened species on the site. One was black-throated finch, and one was the waxy cabbage palm, which is basically this spiky-looking palm tree. He took one look at, look at the two of them. He said, black-throated finch is going to be our focus. Why do you think? Because aren't they cute? So that's a black-throated finch. This is a black-throated finch uh, on someone's fingers. So they're not very big. If you imagine like a black-throated finch on your fingers, it'd be about as big as your hand. They're listed as endangered under the national laws and state laws. Uh, this is a close-up. They're not really this giant bird. You can see the little finger at the base. And this is a flock of about 300, no, 124 of a, a flock of at least 400 that were on the mine site. That was really significant. So there's the mine site. And basically the company and its consultants did um, testing of surveys of where the finch were. And pretty well the biggest population of the finch was exactly where they wanted to put a big open cut mine. So you might think that's a bit of a problem. Finch, open cut mine, finch isn't going to like it. Uh, in fact, this is the biggest population of the finch remaining. Um, there's a, maybe 800 to 1,000 birds in that population. There's only one other big population west of Townsville. So this is critical. This is a critical population for the survival of the finch, and it's not found much in the surrounding area. What the mine proposed to do, though, was have offsets where they would manage the areas around the mine and finch could move to those sites. The problem though with offsets in a case like this is we actually don't know why the finch is where it is. So if you don't know why a species is located at a particular site and you're going to destroy that site and manage other sites, you might think, well, why is it not in those other sites already? What are we going to change? They talked about weeds and fire management and water and, but no one really knows why the finch is there and not in the surrounding area. So how can you adaptively manage, or is it not adaptively manage, how can you provide offsets for something you actually don't know why it's there? So the offsets were basically vaguely put in that sort of hatched area around it. And the big problem is that as um, Martine Marone, she's a great lecturer here in the School of Earth Environmental Sciences at UQ, she wrote a paper several years ago uh, as a lead author criticising the use of um, offsets. And this is a great quote from her paper. One of the most common criticisms levelled at biodiversity offsets is that they exchange certain losses for uncertain gains. So basically we're rolling the dice on these finch, hoping for the best that they will move to these other areas, but we really don't know what the offsets, whether they'll work or not. And again, the miner isn't required to prove that they work before they do the mine. It's basically, we're going to do the mine, and then, fingers crossed, hope the finch are OK. Third thing is climate change. Um, basically, a lot of coal. Big chunk of coal in this mine. Um, in terms of when you're thinking about climate change emissions, when we talk about in later in the course about climate change, we'll talk about scopes of emissions. So when you're looking at a project or a company, uh, the scope one emissions are the direct emissions from an activity. Scope two emissions are emissions associated with electricity production that you use in activity. So in this lecture room, we're using electricity. Let's assume it's not coming from the UQ solar array or any renewables, it's coming from a coal or gas-fired power station. Um, so we, to, for our activity right now, there are scope two emissions associated with us using electricity. But for a big coal mine, the big one are what are the, called the scope three emissions. So they're, they're the emissions from burning the coal. That's about 98% of the emissions. So those are the emissions that occur when coal is burnt wherever it goes to. So this coal was going to be exported. So they occur in India, in China, wherever the coal is burnt. So the environmental impact statement did not calculate or address scope three emissions. And the Queensland government argued that that's all irrelevant. So we're assessing this big mine. And the argument is we shouldn't even think about the emissions from burning the coal. So our, our current approach to assessing climate change impacts of coal mines and coal seam ga gas goes something like this. You put your fingers in your ears, okay, 
You can do it if you like. You put your fingers in your ears and you go, la, 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 I can't hear you. I like this cartoon as well. Uh, so, it, okay, is there anything about the proposed coal mine that we haven't covered in the EIA? So, and a big part of the objections to this mine was we're at a critical level now for the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef has been severely damaged. We know that going forward, more emissions are going to basically kill it. So this is from a paper, some images from a paper by another great UQ uh, scientist, Professor Ophir Goldberg. So he was a lead author back in 2007. They talked about, well, in the future, what can we expect for coral reefs? The image on the left is coral reefs then at about one degree warming, impacted but still pretty healthy. The image in the middle is at two degrees, severely damaged, and the past three degrees completely gone. And then more recently, uh, in late 2018, a special report by the IPCC on global warming at 1.5 degrees found that basically at 1.5 degrees, we expect a further 70 to 90 percent loss of coral reefs. And at two degrees, basically all gone. So that's scary because that's where our international and national and state policies are aiming at. We're aiming at 1.5 or 2 degrees. And at that level, we expect that we won't have coral reefs. And we also know that the primary driver of that is burning fossil fuels. And a paper from back in 2015 basically saying that we've got to pretty well leave all of our remaining fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to have any chance of stabilising at two degrees. So for OEC Pacific, these authors were saying basically 95% of the remaining coal and gas has to stay in the ground. So opening up this mine and the Galilee Basin just is completely inconsistent with that. So the idea of leaving 95% of Australia's coal in the ground completely alien to Australian politics. And, but that's the context of uh, this sort of comment. So when it was approved, the main approvals for the mine were given in 2015-2016. This is a famous coral reef scientist called Charlie Vernon. And he said, well, the decision to approve this mine just defies reason. It defies reason if your objective is to save coral reefs around the world and to save the Great Barrier Reef. Like, it just defies reason. Uh, or it does make sense in, in, in a way um, if, you, if you take this quib from a Canadian environment minister um, you know, well, it doesn't make sense. This is the illogicality of it. Um, he was talking about uh, the Canada's development of the tar sands, massive emissions associated with them, and he said he compared his country's position on greenhouse gases pledging to reduce emissions on one hand while increasing tar sands production on the other, like attempting to ride two horses galloping in opposite directions. And that's the situation we've got right now. So whenever you see Scott Morrison talking about climate change, just imagine you must you know, sitting across two horses going in different directions. So in a recommending approval of these mines, this is a quote from the land court. So there's a big objection in the land court that I was a barrister in. Um, climate change was a big part of the objection. The judge said, basically, if we don't sell them the coal, it'll come from somewhere else, therefore no impact on climate change, which is often called the drug dealer's defence. So if we don't sell it, someone else will. So there's no impact from this mine on climate change. And that's the reasoning that we use in Queensland to justify continuing to expand uh, our coal sector, saying there's a lot of coal in the world. If it doesn't come from here, it'll come from somewhere else. So why don't we make a buck out of it? So if we don't do it, someone else will. Um, similar sort of reasoning at a federal level. The federal environment minister recognised that climate change was a massive ri risk to the Great Barrier Reef, recognised that this was a big source of emissions, but then went on to basically muddy the waters and said, well, I really don't know what the impacts are going to be because of other sources and the like. So it was a sort of muddy the waters approach. Now, just last year, there was a groundbreaking decision in New South Wales which recommended refusal of coal mine based on the scope three emissions. So that was the Gloucester Resources decision by Chief Judge Preston. And I don't think that's my alarm. No, it's always embarrassing if you're 
giving a lecture and the phone goes off. You say, you should switch your phones off. No. Uh, contrast our approach to what happened recently in New South Wales where scope three emissions led to a refusal of a coal mine. And that's been met with outrage by the government. They've proposed laws to remove any consideration of the scope three emissions in assessing a coal mine. So that's currently before the New South Wales Parliament. That's what's happened in New South Wales. In Queensland though, all the big mines in the last few decades have been approved on the basis that if we don't sell it, someone else will. So what can we draw from that and draw from it in terms of us? So okay, a lot of technical stuff there. I don't want you to worry about the technical stuff. What I want to do is say, okay, that's complicated. That's the reality of a lot of these big projects. But what can we learn? The first is that there's a witch's brew of complex technical issues and a lot of environmental assessment processes. And that might sound bad, but it's also for you guys, you know, if you're a town planner or environmental manager, or environmental scientist or an engineer, there's a lot of work in this. There is a massive amount of work because it is so complicated, because the planning system is so complex, because the mining system is so complex, because the issues involved are so complex, proponents engage consultants to uh, prepare their applications, do the EIS, uh, assess compliance, they employ environmental officers to monitor compliance. Uh, within government, there's a lot of technical people there to assess approvals, so a lot of you guys are going to end up working in those sorts of roles. It's complicated. Many people complain about the complexity, but there's no simple solution to it. It's just, it's like complaining about the complexity of, I don't know, atmospheric physics or something, or, you know, physics generally, you know, quantum physics. Does anyone complain about the complexity of quantum physics? No, because everyone knows it's a complicated topic. People complain all the time about the complexity of environmental law, but the reality is it's complicated. We're trying to regulate, in a, say, an area like Queensland, you're regulating millions of people doing millions of things every day, then some activities stretch for years, and you've got the historical baggage of, of approvals that have come in the past, plus you've got impacts that are multi-scalar. There's local impacts, there's regional impacts, there's global impacts. You're trying to manage all of those things. It's incredibly factually complex. And there's difficult disputes with lots of competing interests and stakeholders. Um, yeah. So let's, how do we think about this? So dealing with this complexity, how can we think of it and think of it for, our, for purposes of our course? So there's three basic approaches and I've given you a handout with one of them on it. Um, this little diagram here. So maybe grab that out, gonna come to that. But there's three basic approaches for how we think about the regulatory system that we're gonna look at in our course. The first are called government silos. So if you work for government, so I worked for government when I graduated from science and law here at UQ, I went and worked up in Townsville. And basically when you're in a role enforcing some piece of legislation, you become very siloed. You know, there's your patch, and if people ask you, you know, a member of the general public comes in and asks you about something that some other government department or local government does, you say, oh, I can't tell you about that. You have to go and talk with them. So in government, a lot of the thinking is very siloed. It's very our patch, you know, we're, in, we're implementing the Environmental Protection Act, that's what we look after, that's what we can advise you on. At a national level, we implement the EPBC Act, that's what we can advise you about, that's what we're concerned with. And so there's all these sort of fragments across the regulatory system based on government silos. So obviously there's problems with that. If you're in the private sector, those silos will be frustrating as hell because you go and talk with someone and they can't give you an answer, they say, go and talk with that person. Or, you know, go and find whoever in that department will deal with it, we can't help you. So it can be really frustrating for the private sector, but that's the reality of it. Next, there's what I call traditional categories. Planning, mining, pollution, you know, those sorts of terms are commonly used. So, okay, so in our degrees, you know, people are, might be called town planners. So there's this concept of planning. Uh, you might be working in the mining sector. Uh, you might be working in fisheries management. Uh, all of those categories are commonly used to describe parts of our system. The big problem with those traditional categories, though, is 
you need to be able to work with them because people use them all the time. And in fact, in our course, like if you look at our list of topics, you know, I've got topics that are mining. I've got a topic on nature conservation and water management. So I'm using them to an extent to describe and simplify our course. The big problem though with that approach is that the categories break down really quickly in practice because the, apart from the complexity, modern laws tend to cover things holistically. So laws deal with things like uh, environmental harm, which covers, which might be caused by pollution, it might be caused by land clearing, it might be caused by a big mining project impacting on groundwater. So within one act, you've got all things can be regulated, so the traditional categories break down. The third approach is something that I use and suggest to you for our course. So the categories are useful at a basic level but apt to mislead. Um, four levels, you can think of our system in four levels. So we've got international law, commonwealth laws, so our national laws, and then in Australia we've got six states and two territories. So, and then the common law, which is judge-made law um, beneath it. So, I've given you this as a handout. So, we've got international law, Commonwealth laws, Queensland laws, and the common law. And what we're gonna do in our course is look at the big parts of that system. And I say a jigsaw approach. I'd suggest to you, when you're thinking about environmental regulatory problems, it's best to think of it like a jigsaw, like you're building up a picture. So it's about identifying which of the relevant, which laws are relevant to your problem and then building up that picture. And if you're in the private sector, you have to identify the bits that you, your client needs approval for. So for each project, you have to build up the picture. And for one project, might, you know, only, only require approval under the, say, State Planning Act. But then, say it's a hotel uh, in the centre of Brisbane. It only requires approval under the State Planning Act. But then you've got a hotel which physically is the same, but you put it down near Moreton Bay, uh, right on a Ramsar wetland, and it, which is an international wetland, um, sorry, a, a wetland protected under the Ramsar Convention, an international migratory bird um, convention, which is recognised under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So you've got the same hotel, you put it in a different location, but suddenly it triggers not only the state planning approval, but also a national level approval under the EPBC Act. So the same project, you move locations and a different bit becomes relevant. So this jigsaw approach I find helpful. That diagram that I've given you hopefully will be a useful reference for you and you can, it's linked to a little book that I've given you a link to that's got a summary of all the main bits. Why I like it is it frees up your thinking away from traditional categories to being able to just think, okay, I've got to identify the relevant bits for my problem. So in terms of the levels of government that are relevant, our problem with the Adani mine is a good example as well. So there's three main levels of government in Australia. So we know there's, okay, there's an international law layer. We know there's the United Nations and the like, but there's no international parliament. There's no international body that can impose rules on a country like Australia or China or the US. So there's no rulemaking body at an at a international level that can impose rules on countries unless they accept them basically. So there's this real emphasis on uh, sovereignty, that countries have sovereignty over their territory and they can't be told by others what to do within their territory. So if a country wants to develop all of its coal resources, it's within its sovereign rights to do so. So that's a strong argument at an international level. So a country, in a country like Australia, you can think of our three main levels of government as being our national government. It's a bit confusing because we use terms federal, Australian, Commonwealth, national government interchangeably. And I'm sure I'll do that. I'll, sometimes I'll talk about the Commonwealth government, sometimes I'll call it the Australian government, sometimes I'll call it the federal government. It's all the same government, it's just using a different name for it. Uh, and also a thing that's confusing when you initially sort of walk into the thicket of environmental regulation is there's lots of different government departments. 
So, and they change their names quite regularly. So at the moment, there's the Department of Environment and Energy is the main government department that implements the EPBC Act. Then we come down to a state level, because Australia is made up of a federal system, so we've got a national government and state governments and a constitution that separates power between them. And at a state level, the Queensland government, again, it's made up of many different departments, so we've got the Queensland Department of Environment and Science, there's a whole range of different departments, planning, like. So that's at a state level. And so they're the two main levels that were involved in the approval of the Carmichael coal mine. But we'll also see, when we look at the planning system, that local government is really important. So in Queensland, there's 77 local governments. And again, another confusing use of terms. We call them local governments, but they can also be called city councils, or they can be called council, they can be called a city. So Brisbane City Council is a local government. So who came on a bus today to get to uni? So that's most of us. So you came on a bus that's operated by the Brisbane City Council. So local government, uh, they can also be called regional councils, which is really confusing because they're actually not, there's no local government beneath a regional council. So the regional council is just essentially a local government that covers a broad area. Uh, and they can also be called shires. So they come with different names, but that's that level. And they're really important in the planning framework. Okay, so when we think of that in, in Australia, we've got one national government, six state and territory, six state governments and two territory governments, or two mainland territories. There's around 700 local governments, 77 in, in Queensland. So we talk about three levels, but it's actually much more complicated than that. So when you work in the planning system, for instance, there's a whole range of different planning schemes around. So you have to get used to working with different local governments. And I wrote an article years ago, because everyone asks, well, who is responsible for protecting the environment? And it'd be nice to think of it like a neat, there's a neat answer to that. And logical minds like to think of it like a neatly layered cake, that you know, the Australian national government does X, the state government does Y, local government does Z. But the reality isn't that neat at all. It's more like, if you think of who's responsible for the environment, it's more like scrambled eggs. It's all mixed together. And each level of government has important roles for different things. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. And it's actually all intermixed. So yeah, think of it as a scrambled egg. I've given you also a glossary. I'm not going to go into that. You guys, can, you guys are smart, you can read it. But I'll talk about things like sections or an act of parliament. And I, I know some people are already across that sort of language and for others it's really new. I just found giving you a glossary was a good way or a good way to step over that and get us all on the same page. If there's any terms that I'm using that you can't see in the glossary that you're worried about, ask me for sure. I'm happy to... But yeah, I, I won't go through the glossary. Uh, I've also, I haven't given you this as a physical handout, but on the website, I've, oh, sorry, on the Blackboard site, I put up another handout about underlying theories, assumptions, beliefs in environmental regulations. And I think there's four key assumptions. I don't want to dwell on that. Um, it's something that I've thought a lot about, uh, but I don't want to get too bogged down in the values and background. I really, uh, you know, the takeaway that for you guys from this course are the practical knowledge about the approval, approval systems, what you're going to need to, you know, do your work in your careers. So, again, you can go and have a look at that. So, the focus in this course is on your technical skills. Um, we could just focus on that, uh, but I also, at the same time, don't want to ignore values um, and... I'm trying to find the right blend in this course of training your technical skills for your future careers, but also knowledge of values. And I do that because while science and good policy play a role in environmental regulation, they're by no means dominant, and politics impacts heavily on your careers wherever you're going to go. So advice someone gave to me when I joined the Department of Environment years ago and it was sort of out of the blue. I don't know why he said it to me, but it's something that's always stuck in my mind. He said, Chris, I'll give you one piece of advice. Don't stand in the way of speeding trains. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really weird. 
I'm not going anywhere near a rail line. But he wasn't talking about a real train. It was about, um, I was working for the Department of Environment. There are big projects that are going to be approved. If you stand in their way and say, oh, we shouldn't do this because climate change, you will get run over. So um, don't stand in the way of speeding trains. So the dominant political paradigm in Australia, if we look at like projects like Adani Mine, is that we're going to burn all of our available fossil fuels. You know, we've got our Prime Minister. Um, there's no surprise that the current governments support, um, you know, the Adani Mine. A lot of government decisions are highly political and ideological. And just recently we've had the example of uh, a sports scandal. And there's important lessons about the exercise of ministerial discretion in this sports scandal which led to the then Sports Minister Bridget McKenzie resigning earlier this month. So if you've read any of the stories about it, the Minister's office was assessing these grants for sports, um, sporting grants for like new pools or the like in different electorates. And they went as far as having spreadsheets where on the applications they colour coded them based on whether they were Labor or Liberal or National Party. Uh, and basically a lot of the money, the disproportionate amount of the money went to the seats that they were really fighting for, their own seats or ones that they were fighting to win in the last election. So basically they rorted it. They used federal, you know, public money pretty well as a pork barrel for their re-election. So they could go out and the local member could go out and announce, oh, we've secured $60 million to rebuild the local pool. Yay for us, vote for us. So this spreadsheet actually is, you will very rarely see that. Rarely will you ever see such a naked example of political decision making where it's actually on a spreadsheet. Because most of this just happens in the back sort of cobwebs. Most people aren't stupid enough to put this on paper where it can be, you know, an FOI report or a right to information request can bring it to public knowledge. It just sort of happens in the background. Uh, so this sports scandal has lessons for environmental law because there's a lot of ministerial discretion that's skewed uh, and we just don't see them with colour spreadsheets. But when you see in the law things like the minister will consider the public interest, well that's a weighing up of all the benefits and costs of a project. And basically it gives the minister a big black box within which to hide whatever their reasons are for the decision and they can simply say the mine is in the public interest. Weighing all of the factors, I've decided that the mine is in the public interest. There's no quantitative limits for impacts against which refusal is mandatory. So often when we're looking at the law, it's a bit like this. It's a bit like seeing the shark fin poking out of the water, okay? You can see, okay, the law says you can consider the public interest. That's what's on the surface, but we know leaking, sorry, leaking? Um, lurking beneath that <laughs> uh, as some big teeth and that's where the real action is. So think of this, the surface is what the law says on paper and then beneath the surface the exercise of discretion. So as an example the law states goals for sustainable development and allows discretion for approval in the public interest. That's what the law says on paper Beneath the surface, there's a strong preference or a culture. I'm avoiding the word bias deliberately. Let's just say culture. There's a strong culture supporting growth. And by growth, I mean unlimited expansion, private profit, money, employment and jobs, um, such as in construction. And in my view, that's the only real way you can explain how the Adani mine got approved because the environmental impacts were horrendous. How is it in the public interest if objectively viewed my thought is that beneath the surface, it's these are the drivers, growth, private profit, and employment jobs. But you don't see that written down in the law, and you don't normally see that in the minister's decision justifying it. So ministers, who are politicians, often make political decisions based on supporting um, growth, private profits, and jobs. But so will government departments, local governments, and independent agencies. So if you're working for government, you know what the Minister and Premier have said about, you know, this big project that you're assessing? If the Premier has come out and say, we support the XYZ resort on the Fraser Coast, you know, we want it to go ahead. We fully, uh, you know, we, we support this huge investment in regional jobs and um, the, the sector 
the, the tourism sector, you know that, you see it in the papers. You're assessing that project, are you gonna say, oh, I don't think this is a good idea. The Premier has already announced in the paper what the government thinks. You know what the politics are. So don't be naive to think that the law will protect the environment. There's often a big gap between what the law says on paper and how it is implemented. And we live in a culture, basically, that supports growth, private profit and jobs. And, yeah, environmental legislation is often partly symbolic. So don't be naive, but don't be cynical. Uh, law and regulation can do, can do a lot of good and you can do a lot of good with it during your career. So the tools that you learn in this course, I'm hoping that you'll be able to go out there and have some real, really good outcomes for the world. So don't be naive, cynical, but be realistic. Um, and as a real, realist, recognise that many government decisions are not based on science. I like to think of um, our system in, in this way. We've got a whole heap of goals, jobs, employment, housing, clean food and water, strong families, public health and peace and security. So if you think of it like fruit of a tree, the things that we're going for as a society, beneath that, the things that achieve those goals are good governance and justice, education and a healthy environment. So to me, that's a holistic view of our goals, that it's not our law shouldn't just be directed to the environment protection, um, but we should recognise that environment protection is absolutely foundational to everything that we want to achieve. OK, I want to take a break uh, and get up, stretch your legs. Should we take five minutes? Uh, if you need to go to the loo, we'll come back and we'll dive into the uh, course outline and run through it, what we're going to cover in the course to deal with those sorts of issues. Let's kick back off. I want to deal with who am I, who are you, and then look at the course profile. So very briefly, Chris is my name. Uh, this is a picture, a lot of people will be listening to this recording online, so that's me. Uh, and this is my little girl, Isabel, and that's her sister, Eva. And that's them being very cute, which doesn't happen, they're older now and they fight. Uh, this is me as a uh, young boy, I was about 16, standing with my dad who passed away 10 years ago. But we were standing on Whitehaven Beach in the Whitsunday, so I'm from North Queensland. So Whitehaven Beach, if you haven't been there, it's the best beach in the world, without a doubt. I haven't been to all the beaches in the world. Some people say that there's this great beaches in Brazil, but I say they're nothing on the Whitsundays. So Whitehaven Beach, most beautiful spot in the world. So that picture was taken. Just there, uh, standing on this, the spit at the, at the entrance to Hill Inlet. I remember the day, it was so beautiful and so bright. And as I walked around on the, I, I'm squinting there because you know that when the, the sand is so bright, you can't open your eyes. I just remember it being glaring. And as you walked around, like bubbles would come up out of the sand, but it was just so ridiculously bright. And yeah, as a kid growing up, spearfishing in the area, um, I grew up around sugarcane farms. Uh, this is the Tully floodplain, so pretty well where, when I grew up, sugar everywhere. Uh, the creeks were just generally a, you know, gap where um, sugar wasn't, um, but, or even for a lot of the smaller creeks, the sugar just went straight through the creek. It was like a little depression. So everything cleared, a little bit of vegetation left along the main rivers. So. The question though that's driven me, because I grew up in North Queensland, uh, love the Great Barrier Reef, uh, and came to realise through my PhD that um, along 15 or so years ago, hey, the Great Barrier Reef is hugely threatened by climate change, what are we doing about it? And the thing that's driven me for the last 15 years professionally is this question, will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? I think it's important to uh, you know, do things to keep yourself inspired and uh, keep yourself balanced. So this is me walking in Tasmania. Um, so that's a bit of background about me. I've been, I was a science law student here at UQ. I graduated, went to work in Townsville for the Department of Environment, got frustrated with that and the lack of enforcement, came back to Brisbane, did a Master of Laws, started as a barrister, worked as a barrister, started a PhD. Uh, then. I was working too much and <laughs> uh, we had our first child and my 
um, we're just done this big case about a big um, dam and my partner Brooke said to me, Chris, do another case like that and don't expect me to be here. Which is, you might regard as a kind of big red flag. Uh, so um, I left working as a barrister and came here from 2010 to 2016. I was full time uh, here teaching this course as well as a international course EMBM 3104 and 7124. So I did that for six years and then returned to practice as a barrister and then this year um, the school just needed someone to, to teach this semester. There's a different staff member starting uh, halfway through the year who will teach it next year but they asked me to come and teach and I thought oh, it's so much fun to teach this course. Uh, so rolled up my sleeves and updated, you know, I'm spending a lot of time updating things that and developing the course through also what I've learned since 2016 in practice. But my primary work is as a barrister, but I really like education, teaching, communication about complex laws, hopefully so that you guys can do good things with them. So that's where I'm coming from. I've got a website, environmentallaw.com.au, which has got a lot of case studies about environmental litigation. Um, I'll use a lot of them in in different problems that we look at in different lectures. So you don't need to go and look at it, but there's a lot of information there. For instance, on the Carmichael coal mine, there's a big case study with all of the big reports and you know just a huge amount of information if you were interested in that, but you don't have to. We are really fortunate for the internal course to have a fantastic tutor, Revel Poynton, who I've managed to uh, snare from the Environmental Defender's Office. She works in West End, she's a fantastic environmental lawyer. She did her degrees here at UQ uh, and a couple of years ago she was the Australian Young Environmental Lawyer of the Year. She's a really fabulous uh, role model and yeah just a, a great person. So Revel is going to be, I'll be, I plan to go to all of the tutes uh, and work with Revel so you'll see me a lot in the tutes and able to answer your questions but the tutes are quite big. Some of the tutes are like 40 people so Revel and I will essentially tag team. We'll have little problems that we work through in the tutes, but essentially you'll be on computers looking at things, doing things related to the group assignment principally. Uh, so you'll see Revel. Okay, so who are you? So there's about 150 students in the undergraduate course, a lot of environmental management students, about 30%, a lot of town planning students, about another 20%, engineering students as well, uh, environmental scientists, uh, occupational health and safety. So I think for all of those courses, this is a core course. Uh, I always, I like the comments uh, at the end of the course and a lot of people I know are here because you have to be, it wouldn't actually be, I mean while I'm excited about being here and this is a fantastic course, I know that for a lot of people you're here because the court, your program requires it. I really like though the comments at the end of the semester, There's, I remember a couple, uh, one saying, you know I thought this was going to be a really boring course. But it turned out it wasn't half as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I'm hoping to, if you have a negative view about environmental regulation at this stage, I'm hoping that I can bring you into the tent and, you know, let you see how exciting and fantastic this course or this subject is. Uh, similarly, postgrads, a uh, lot of environmental managers, a lot of town planners, and uh, there's about 90 students uh, in the postgraduate course. So I used the, I, I looked at many years ago, I looked at how many, you know, where the students come from and that was very much how I designed the course around a group assignment and using multidisciplinary groups. So in the groups that you work with for the group assignment, I really want to try and split up, s split you up so that you're not just working with people from your own degree. Okay, I already know you're smart. You wouldn't be here if you weren't really smart. You know, you've survived hundreds of exams to get to this point. I know you are smart. Uh, I know you're not here for the money. No one does town planning, environmental management, engineering, uh, environmental science, occupational health and safety for the money. If uh, you're here for the money, you would be studying law or accounting or business or some other soul destroying subject like that. Um, you want to make a positive contribution to the world. I know that, as I said, some people are only here because it's a compulsory subject. Um, I'm hoping that, yeah, to change your mind on that, that this is actually, I want you to see that this is really important for you and your careers. 
Okay, let's look at the course profile. I'll give you a little handout. Just want to touch on a few things. You can read it online. I know you're smart. I'm not going to take you through it in a huge amount of detail. But let's just touch on the big picture things. Course aims, lecture and tutorial topics, assessment and field trips. So the learning objectives, I've noticed uh, just this morning when I was looking at it, there's a glitch in the learning objectives uh, in that if you actually look at them online, there's two number sixes and what I intended to be number, so there should be eight, um, but if you look at them online, there's six, six and then seven and the first six should be number seven. So I've asked ITS to change that, to correct it because it's in all of the course profiles. It wasn't how I wrote it. Um, the, it's supposed to be these eight. Um, so there's some learning objectives about basically understanding the law, the things that you will need to be able to do your job. So recall and apply the main processes and principles by which planning and environmental regulatory frameworks in Queensland operate. Um, but five um, and six particularly, um, prepare a properly made um, develop an application. Uh, those are the things that I hope will give you good practical skills. And then there's some ethical aspects that I really want you to take away as well. So at the end of this course, we're gonna look at professional duties uh, and ethics because I came to realize a few years ago that for most of you, this is the only law course that you'll do in your entire degrees. So we should look at some things like duty of care, corruption and the like. And we shouldn't just assume that everyone understands them because when in private practice, you know, things like duty of care, risk of negligence, insurance issues, they are big problems. So we're going to deal with that in the final lecture in the course. Okay, this course is really about giving you the practical knowledge and skills to navigate the maze of laws that protect the environment during your professional careers. And it's particularly, I'm, when I'm thinking about this course and thinking about you guys, I'm really thinking about what you need to know for the first two years of your careers because you're going to learn a lot more than we will cover in this course during your careers. You know, if you're a town planner uh, or an environmental manager or engineer, you know, you don't go out and suddenly, you know, you, you'll have a junior role when you graduate. You don't go out and suddenly you're in charge of writing an entire planning scheme or assessing an entire massive mine and conditioning it, you know, and no one else to help you. You'll be working in a team with people who are more experienced so you will learn a lot from them. What I'm hoping you take from this course is that you can walk into any office and you can do basic skills like you know, find the development assessment system uh, uh, forms. You know, so if you're a town planner, you go into a consultancy and they say, hey, we've got this new application, can you, you know, this new client, can you prepare their application? It's really simple. I want you to be able to find the forms, start preparing a report, start doing the things that, you know, you don't want to look silly, that, oh, what are the, where are the f development assessment forms, you know? How do I find that? Where's the planning scheme? I want you to have those skills when you leave this course. You'll learn a lot more though, and I don't want to cover things that you will learn, you know, in year 10 when you're a senior manager in the Department of Environment. So you can think of this course like a legal first aid. Um, so you won't be able to perform open heart surgery when you leave, you know, just like, has everyone here done first aid? So cool, you know, you do a few days with St John's or, you know, whoever you did it. And at the, at the end, you can do some complicated things, you know, like CPR or the like, but no one would expect you at the end of a three day first aid course to be able to perform open heart surgery. This course is like that you're not expected to be a fully qualified lawyer or to do really complicated things at the end of this course, but the skills that you learn are like what you learn in first aid. They're really important core skills that you can use all the time. So yeah, it's like learning CPR. My goal is to make the law interesting and practical and not drown you in un unnecessary details and I really want you to enjoy this course. So in terms of learning resources for it, there's no set textbook. I've put this summary text. It's about what, 40 pages long. It's just got a summary. The idea with that book was to give you a map of the overall system. There's little summaries of each bit of legislation and then a link to the best available website for it because you, know, you can get a huge amount of information on government websites. The problem with those websites is though they really adopt that silo approach You'll go to the planning website, it won't tell you anything about the Commonwealth. It won't tell you anything about other levels even within the Queensland government. 
So they're very much a silo approach. So what the idea with that book is, and the handout I've given you, is to give you a map so you don't get lost in the websites. But there's a huge amount of information available, obviously, on the web and different websites. There's plenty of textbooks. I don't prescribe any because I don't find them particularly useful. I really want to just get you guys you know, able to go onto local government websites, find the planning scheme, download it, you know, use it, find the law, download it, read it, use it. But there's heaps of, you know, you can go to the library, heaps of books on different topics. A couple of recent ones, if you did really want to buy a book, there's a book about to be come out um, by Rowena Maguire, uh, Evan Harmon, uh, Justin Bell James, who's here at UQ, Amanda Kennedy and Philippa England. Uh, it's to be published in a few days' time, so it's not actually available yet. It's $85, uh, Environmental Planning and Climate Law in Queensland. You don't have to buy it, but if you did want to have a textbook, uh, I'm sure that would be a good reference. I actually haven't seen it yet, but I know all the authors. I'm sure it'll be good. Jerry Bates also writes the main textbook um, on environmental law in Australia. It's in its 10th edition, 500 pages long, $156 to buy new. You can find it in the library. Again, I wouldn't recommend you buy it because uh, I don't... I like Jerry and, and it's a useful reference text, but I very much want you to be m more using local government planning schemes, using the practical things rather than the theory. In terms of this course, you can think of teaching and learning in a course like this a bit like a game of chess. There's a lot of things moving. So for me, in terms of the big, you know, the queen and the bishop and the pawns and all of the things that are moving uh, in the strategy that I'm developing to help you learn and develop your skills, there's some big bits. So we've got 13 lectures where I'm trying to give you short summaries of complicated topics in a sort of takeaway package where I can bring you in to show you some of the practical implications of them, the broad frameworks, the lectures are sort of introductory in a range of different topics. There's also the 13 tutorials and practicals, so we're starting tutorials this week. There's two field trips uh, and then there's the assessment and there's also going to be some voluntary online quizzes. So I'm aiming to engage your curiosity, creativity and imagination and give you practical skills and knowledge. So the 13 lectures I've already uh, mentioned Today we've got our introduction, then we've got three lectures on the planning system effectively. So next week we'll be looking at planning schemes, development assessment and conditions and development offences. Mining and environmental impact assessment comes after that. Coal, sorry, um, coal seam gas, environmental harm, nature conservation, water management, commonwealth, climate change, and then finishing with professional duties. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground. I've given you this as a handout. It's too complicated to look at, but um, I wanted, I sort of made it prettier, so then you get it on the um, course profile online. Uh, so 13 weeks um, with the dates, the lecture topics, and then the tutorials. So the tutorials are running in line with effectively the group assignment and assessment. So the first 10 tutorials are really about helping you prepare the development application for the group assignment. And then in week 11, we'll do a statutory interpretation topic. And then in the last few weeks, we'll run through past exams to help you prepare for the end of semester exam. So you don't have to worry about the exam at this stage. We're really going to focus on the group assignment. And that's going to help you because on the um, exam, there's a big question basically that's linked to what you learn in the group assignment. So 40% for the group assignment, you might think that's a lot of work for the 40%. You get it. Um, sort of double dip on it though because you get a lot of information that you'll use on the exam from it. So I really try and make the internal and external courses as much as possible the same. So I'm going to record all lectures, shoots and field trips and put them, uh, make them available on the Blackboard site. So if you are internal and you have to skip a week because you're sick or work or whatever, that's okay. It's all available there for you. Many students are completely external. Uh, Overseas, there's quite a few students uh, stuck in China at the moment. So, okay, and the assessment is about more than giving your marks. So think of the assessment in this course about helping you learn. So there's a group assignment worth 40% where you prepare a development application and there's also the end of semester exam which is basically problem-based, problem-solving. It's an open book. Um, the postgrads have an option if you've got extensive experience in development assessment You've got an option for an individual research paper, 
but I expect there'll be only one or two students, if that, that will actually take that option. Virtually everyone does the group assignment. But uh, if you've got extensive experience and you just don't think it's going to help you learn, then there's that option there. It's not there for the undergraduates. Okay, so the group assignment, I'll run through this in the tut, but effectively what you've got to do is, sorry, the tut this week, I'll look at it in more detail, and we'll be obviously working on it in the tutes, but in a group of three to four students, you're to prepare a properly made development application under the Planning Act for a material change of use of either of two locations, Samurai, which is a cattle property, or any land in the town of Ackland. And basically your group acts as a planning and environmental management consultancy. And your application will consist of a number of parts, including the forms, but the main part will be a report where you address the planning scheme environmental issues. And I particularly want you to focus on um, bushfire risk and management in it. For Obviously that's going to be a massive focus going forward in planning is basically bushfire management. The criterion standards are in the back of the handout. Uh, I'll talk about them again in tutorials, I won't dwell on them, but you get to choose what you develop on the land. So I'm giving you the land, I'm not telling you what to develop. You might have, you can put anything on the land, but you're marked against how practical your proposals are. So you have to think about what can we do on this land that makes sense and that's likely to be approved. We'll be helping you with the development application through tutorials. Um, and this peer assessment, I know group work, some people really hate it and you, some people have bad experiences. For the vast majority, I'm hoping that your experience will be really good. There's peer assessment for the group assignment, you can read about it in the course profile. There's also a self-assessment competition, again you can read about that chance to get an extra mark if you can identify, uh, assess your own um, work and say what you think it um, should be awarded and if you're basically right, then you get an extra mark. Uh, there'll be some voluntary online quizzes. Essentially, you won't have any marks for them, but you get the answer immediately. One of the big comments I've had in the past is um, from students is they want more feedback. Um, difficult with 230 students to give everyone individual feedback. So the online quizzes are developed basically to allow you to individualise sort of feedback. You can click on and see where maybe gaps are in your knowledge. So there'll be online quizzes. The end of semester exam, we'll talk about more at the end of semester, but essentially it's two hours, open book, so you can take in anything, it's worth 60% of the course. Um, there's information, that's the same for both courses. The exams are different, uh, undergraduates have some multi-choice questions, postgraduates have more essays. Um, there's an information sheet on the, black on the Blackboard site um, about it, so if you want to go and have a look at that, It'll tell you more information about the exam and we'll talk more about it um, in the lead up at the end of semester. So it's a challenging course, but um, you know, you do the work, you'll get the marks. So this is some grades from the undergraduates in 2014. So about 13% grade of sevens, 36% grade of six, 26% grade of five, 20% grade of four and a few fails. Um, so challenging, but I hope good challenging. Um, I'm here to help and going to yeah, do a lot of work to assist you to learn this complex area. There's two field trips, uh, one next week on Monday, uh, one o'clock. We're just basically going to go around a childcare centre which is just outside our lecture room. We're going to walk around it and in the tutorials we're going to use um, the development application associated with the childcare centre because it was built a few years ago. We can find the forms online and we're going to use it as an example for what we're then going to do in the group assignment. So next week, uh, one o'clock um, on the Monday after the uh, lectures. Then the week after that, we're going out to the Darling Downs on a bus, and we're going to go to two sites that you can choose for your group assignment. So next week, uh, we're going to meet just outside the building at one o'clock, and we're going to walk around a childcare centre. Um, the field trip on the Darling Downs, we're going to go around this big coal mine. So the Darling Downs is, the site's about 130 kilometres west. It takes about three hours to get out there on the bus. And the two sites are located to the north of this big mine and then one right next to the mine. So we're going to go to both of those, look at them. It'll be really useful for you for your group assignment. And 
The field trip's voluntary, not assessed. I'll film key parts of it. If you can't make it, that's okay. But I think it's, I really want to emphasise, it's really valuable to go out and kick the dirt, look around, get a feel for sites that you're proposing to develop or working on. Any questions? Okay. Uh, dealt with the story of environmental regulation and action. Talked about who I am, who you are. Looked at the course profile. Can I wrap up with this as the final slide? The take home points I will give you for this lecture are environmental regulation is often very complex and not just about the science or facts. Politics and culture play crucial roles beneath the surface. Secondly, you can think of the law like a jigsaw um, and that you need to solve by piecing together the bits relevant to any problem. Thirdly, there are four main levels of environmental regulation in Queensland, international, national, state and local, local government through planning schemes but in the common law. Uh, and this course aims to give, provide you with the tools to navigate your first two years of professional practice. That's what I'm aiming to give you and I hope you're going to find it a great course. Okay, in terms of further reading, have a read of the ECP online, the electronic course profile, the peer assessment process and the like. If you've got any questions, uh, shoot me an email or give me a call. I've put my mobile in the um, course profile. Uh, you've also got the handouts from this course, the glossary and the others, so have a look at those. Thanks very much, everyone. That's our first lecture.